Uh, so um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I've been, so DataWire, we've been doing microservices for almost three years now. We've built some microservices internally. We've also consulted with organizations doing microservices and we also make open source software um, for making microservices easy around Kubernetes. And so this talk is kind of a distillation of everything we've tried to learn and sort of compile into something that kind of makes sense hopefully. Uh, around building developer workflows on Kubernetes, which is a big topic. And what, one of the things we found is sort of a underrated portion when you start thinking about adopting microservices. So um, totally fine interactive, so you don't need to wait till the end to ask questions. And if I think I already answer it in the presentation later on, I'll just tell you and then you can always ask the question again. So, um, so with that, um, actually, before I start, actually, how many people here actually build cloud software versus on-prem? Okay, so like half, maybe? Maybe more than half? Okay. So, so the question I think everyone always faces is how do you actually build better software faster? Um, the framing of this talk is really around cloud software because I don't really know very much about building on-prem software anymore. Um, it has left my brain. Um, and so. You know, the, the, and the answer that everyone knows is all hot and exciting is instead of one rocket launch, you do multiple asynchronous launches, which people call microservices, right? And uh, when you think about microservices, what, do you actually, what are you actually doing? And what we find that companies that are successfully adopting microservices, they take your standard development process, right, where you have a product organization that defines product requirements and they talk to customers, hopefully. And then you have some developers and a development team that actually writes the code. And then you have a QA team maybe sometimes, and maybe these are different roles and not necessarily different people, right? And then you have a release team, release engineering, and then you have an ops team that sort of runs it in production, right? So you take this flow that you're running your entire engineering organization through, right? You have a release defined for the Q1 release, if you're using time-based releases, you have this release train concept, right? And you code to this release date, and then you go to a feature freeze, and then you test this thing. This entire cycle that everyone I'm sure here is super familiar with, right? And what you do with microservices, you make it distributed, right? So microservices, you, you eliminate that central release cadence, and you have each person or each team working on a service operate independently. And what this means, though, is a huge organizational cultural shift because your team actually needs to have all the skills and knowledge to operate all aspects of that development process, right? So your team is now responsible not just for just writing code, but they also have to figure out how to test it. They need to figure out how to release it. And they also need to figure out how to operate it in production, right? Because that's what you're actually shifting their responsibilities to, right? And by doing this, you actually improve velocity because now, no team is actually bottlenecked on some other team, right? So, and the key is you need to think about this distributed nature of, it's distributed systems all over again, right? Because if your team is actually bottlenecking on a central resource, that team is no longer able to operate independently. So, so the definition I like to use for microservices is that it's a distributed development process for cloud native software, right? So a lot of people will say microservices architecture, I'm like, I don't really like microservices architecture because that implies that's where you need to start. Um, but really, your architecture should actually support your process and not the other way around. So really think about how you're actually doing development, right? how you'd like to do development, and then figure out an architecture to actually support that. So, um, so, we, so we, we've certainly talked to lots of organizations, and they start thinking about microservices, and they start thinking about Kubernetes, and they start thinking about gRPC and Istio and all these sort of fancy technologies that are very cool. Um, and we try to sort of sh turn that around a little bit and say, well, how do you actually start thinking about your workflow? Because that's actually what you're trying to do. You're trying to make development faster, right? And that starts with your workflow, not your architecture. So, so how do you actually, how do we actually suggest you actually get started? So, um, so if microservices is a distributed development process, then you should take advantage of that and actually create a new team. Right? And I like to think of it as spin-off. Right? So you take your existing engineering team and you create a spin-off, whether it's one person or a team or whatever. And you say, just create a service. You figure out what that service is actually supposed to do. And you access it through an API. You probably have existing code with your monolith. And just like you access any other API service, whether it's Twilio or Stripe, you actually access that new API service um, through its API. 
Right, you already have a way to access Twilio. You already have a way to access Stripe. So just use the same systems to access that new service. Right, and that team creates a new API, and they're allowed and empowered to use whatever process they um, they can. Right, they don't. They're not beholden to your existing process. Right, and that's the key. Um, however, of course, if you just put a bunch of developers and say you're just in charge of operations, you've kind of got a recipe for disaster. Right, so you actually want to think a little bit about how you actually make them successful. Um, and there are two things that you actually need to think about uh, to make uh, this team successful. One is this team needs to be self-sufficient, right? So as soon as this team um, needs to talk to someone else, they're no longer self-sufficient. And if you think about being super productive, when you have to ask someone else another question, then you're not being as productive. Now, it's great to interact with people, and you should, I'm not discouraging that. But every time you have to open a ticket with someone else or wait for QA to do something, or wait for a customer to get back to you, it slows you down, right? And so you really want to think about how you actually be self-sufficient um, so that you can maximize your forward velocity. Um, but self-sufficiency isn't actually enough, right? You also need to think about the fact that your team doesn't necessarily have expertise in every single one of these functional areas. And just like Karen's really amazing talk uh, a little while ago, you actually need to figure out how to provide safety in your systems, right? Your systems need to provide safety so that if you have an oops in production and everyone makes an oops in production, hopefully you minimize the impact of that oops, right? So you really want to figure out how do you build systems that provide self-sufficiency for teams as well as safety. So, so of course, this sounds very complicated and a lot of work. And you know, so the question is, well, do you have to build all this stuff from scratch? Um, and luckily, um, the industry has actually come a really long way. So we're big fans of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, um, which is part of the Linux Foundation, which has done an amazing job of identifying all sorts of emerging technologies that cloud native companies should really look at. Um, and I'm going to highlight three of them that we believe are sort of foundational components to provide that safe self-sufficiency. I like alliteration. So um, the first one is Docker, right? So um, how many of you guys use Docker today? OK, so everyone knows about Docker. Most people know do about Docker, right? It's got a massive community ecosystem, lots of third-party tools. It lets you build and package and deploy your service and its dependencies in sort of a consistent way that you can run in a whole bunch of different places, whether it's your laptop or your VM or in Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes. Um, so Kubernetes, how many of you guys run Kubernetes? OK, not as many. So. Um, so Kubernetes, for those of you folks who um, aren't super familiar, is uh, it lets you run Docker containers um, in the cloud or on your own bare metal. Um, but one of the ways I like to think about Kubernetes is it's not just a container scheduler. It's actually more, of, more akin to POSIX right, for the cloud. So by this, I mean it's actually an operating system for how you run all of your cloud infrastructure. And it provides this. YAML-based syntax for defining how all your cloud infrastructure is supposed to run from you know, how many containers you're going to run, how do you actually update these containers, how do you store secrets, how do you mount persistent volumes. It does a lot of things that you might not necessarily associate with container scheduling, um, but it actually lets you basically define all of your cloud infrastructure in this hideously complex YAML file. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, isn't there other stuff other than Kubernetes out there? There's Mesos, there's Nomad, there's Docker Swarm. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, to which I think that Kubernetes is actually one, this sort of container scheduling war. Um, first of all, there's, it's the fastest growing project um, in the space um, in terms of contributors. So it has the most community momentum. Um, it's got some massive companies behind it. Uh, Google started it, but it has branched out so that Red Hat is a core contributor. There is uh, Microsoft is a major contributor. Um, Oracle just announced a couple weeks ago that they are all in on Kubernetes, right? And what's astonishing is that if you look at sort of the commit ratios, of no company actually contributes more than 30% of the commits to Kubernetes. Um, and the big, the big company that's not on the Kubernetes like bandwagon really kind of is Amazon. Um, but 62% of production Kubernetes workloads are actually on Amazon. Um, and that's because the reality is, is back in the day, all these cloud software companies did, did all the stuff on EC2, and they used RDS and all these fancy Amazon stuff, and that's where the data is stored. And now they're moving to Kubernetes, and so they don't want to migrate databases. So therefore, they're deploying Kubernetes on Amazon. Um, 
And uh, Mesos is another company they just announced, I think it was two weeks ago, that uh, they're, they've been engineering for however many months uh, Kubernetes on DCOS. So in other words, with the, maybe the exception of Amazon, every other major player in the cloud ecosystem is embracing Kubernetes. And even Amazon, inevitably, they're, they're actually blogging about how you do Kubernetes on, on AWS. So, um, so I think from my perspective, if you're actually thinking about container scheduling, um, Kubernetes is um, the, the obvious choice. And the third technology, um, which probably people are probably least familiar with, has anyone heard of Envoy? OK, so actually, um, a good number of folks. Um, so Envoy is a, is a layer 7 proxy. Uh, it was written initially by the engineers at Lyft. Um, you can think of it as sort of a modern, updated version of uh, HAProxy or Nginx. Um, but it provides a lot of the functionality you need um, for a distributed cloud architecture. When you have multiple services and multiple containers talking to each other, that all happens typically over layer 7. And so you actually need some support for doing more sophisticated things at layer 7 that you previously didn't. Things like global rate limiting or circuit breaking or monitoring of those metrics. And so Envoy actually, um, actually provides all that. Uh, and Envoy actually has also been gaining a lot of momentum. It was just accepted in the CNCF uh, a few weeks ago. Um, Lyft obviously is a big contributor. Um, there are actually a couple dozen engineers at Google, actually based in Kendall Square here, that are actually working on um, upstream enhancements to Envoy so they can swap all of Google.com to be running on Envoy. Um, you know, there's, uh, IBM is actually investing in it. So there's a whole bunch of uh, different companies actually working on Envoy. Um, and so I'm going to actually show how the combination of these three technologies actually um, let you do something interesting. So, so what have I talked about so far? Um, first is microservices is a distributed development workflow that hopefully helps you go faster if you think about it. Um, you should start your microservices journey by building an efficient workflow for your first services team, um, and then think about your rest of your organization. Um, and then if you combine Kubernetes, Docker, and Envoy, it provides the foundational components you need to build that workflow. OK. so. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, a workflow using these things, right? So, um, so de typical developer workflow starts with you need to bootstrap your service, right? Um, you need some sort of template or something like that. Then you actually write some code. Then you actually run your code, maybe in a development cluster, maybe somewhere else, right? And you kind of do this over and over again until you actually have something that is ready for um, broader testing, right? And so at that point, you actually deploy to a production Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then you hopefully have some sort of monitoring or analytics to actually see how well that thing is running. And then that itself becomes your production workflow where you go back and you get some feedback from customers or metrics that crashes in production, whatever. And then you write some more code, test it, and you go through this over and over again. Right? Um, so how do you actually maximize productivity in this? Um, and the answer is you want to actually go fast. Right? The faster you can go. Um, the more productive you are, it's kind of like going from you know, five-minute compile times to five-second compile times. There's sort of an asymmetric jump in developer productivity. Similar concept here. Um, I think the point I'd emphasize is that the more self-sufficient you are, that's actually where you're driving um, the productivity. Um, it's not necessarily just about just how long it takes for you to actually mechanically deploy something in production. It's like how self-sufficient you actually are. Um, so I'm going to walk through each of these steps um, in a little more detail. Um, so uh, to, to, with an emphasis on how do we make these things faster, right? So the first step, you bootstrap the service. Um, typically what people do is they create a template, um, right? And you don't need to use anything super fancy. You can just create a Git repository with your example code. Um, and you can just tell everyone, just clone this repository, right? There's no fancy technology here. And typically in your template, um, you'll need a Docker file, which specifies how you actually build your code um, and container. Um, you'll need, a, say, a Kubernetes directory, which stores your Kubernetes manifest, which is a fancy term for how you actually um, run your, your particular service in Kubernetes. Um, and there might be more than one file, which is why you put it in a directory, or you can put it in one big file. Um, you might have another directory, which specifies how you actually provision non-Kubernetes resources. So you might have a Terraform directory. Um, 
you might you would have uh, your application stub, and then um, frequently you might have a YAML file that sort of specifies metadata about your application itself, like the name of your particular service or whatever, right? So that's the first thing. So you want to create a service template that people can just clone. The second thing you want to do is you want to build a productive development environment, um, and this is actually um, kind of tricky because if you're doing a multi-service, multi-container environment, you mu usually might have like 5, 10, 15 services that are running around um, that your service might need to talk to, right? And so how do you actually set up a good development environment for that? And there's usually this trade-off um, between sort of local development, where if you run everything on your laptop, you get really fast feedback, right? Because you make a code change, and you hit reload, and then boom, you can see how everything works, right? Um, the problem, of course, is that if you run 15 servers on your laptop, it might melt, right? And then you can also run everything remotely, but then you typically access that through some sort of CI CD pipeline. Um, and no matter how fast you make it, it still takes a few minutes to run. So you really don't want to take like two minutes for um, two minutes to wait for to see if your two line code change actually works, right? Um, so people do all sorts of different things. Um, typical design patterns is if you run the system locally, people use Docker Compose. Um, which is really nice because it's fast, it's lightweight. Most people already have Docker running. Um, the trade-off is um, Docker Compose isn't exactly like Kubernetes, so you create this environmental difference between dev and production. Um, so people then look at Minikube. The problem with Minikube is it requires a VM, and especially if you're using JVM inside the VM, um, your laptop melts pretty quickly. Um, so, so that's sort of the trade-off. Um, you can run your business logic locally and then all your databases and all this other stuff in the cloud. Um, and some people do this. Um, it's a little bit more work around setup, but it's sort of more resource efficient. Um, another uh, sort of the next model is you can run a single service locally and then use network proxies with something like Telepresence um, to actually remotely proxy all this stuff into the cloud. Um, and so you might have like your 15 services running in the cloud and one service running locally. So that kind of um, means you can't operate disconnected, um, but it actually gives you that fast feedback and you don't worry so much about resource consumption. Um, and probably where most people start is they start with just all remote development. You have Kubernetes with a CI CD pipeline. Um, and that actually works, um, I mean, because you generally need a CI CD pipeline anyway. So this is probably the least amount of effort to actually set up. It's just that um, you, from a developer productivity standpoint, you know, you make a code change, you have to wait for the pipeline to run before you actually can test it out. So, so you have a development environment, you have a service template, you need to now deploy your code to a development cluster. Um, so this is actually, it's kind of complicated, um, but it's eminently scriptable, right? But I'll just sort of walk through the mechanics of this. So you want to build a container image that contains your code and all the dependencies, and this is pretty straightforward with Docker, so you just call Docker build, right? Then you need to tag the image, um, so, so that way you can actually roll back to this image, um, so you always have a semantic way to say that this is the version that I really want, which you can do with Docker tag, and if you're clever, you can actually do Docker build dash T and pass the tag in. Um, you push the image to a container registry once it's actually built, um, which frequently lives in the cloud, and this, again, is Docker push. And you can see these are all sort of one-line commands. And this is my point around how Kubernetes, Docker, and Envoy actually give you most of what you need. And you, know, you just need to write a script around some of this stuff, right? You need to update your Kubernetes manifest so it references the image. Um, so this is a little bit trickier because your Kubernetes manifest is a YAML file, so you actually need some sort of templating system. Um, nothing super sophisticated. You can even use sed or some sort of regular expression um, to actually deploy this. Um, and then you need to tell the cluster to run this Kubernetes manifest. And what's going to happen, you run this thing called kubectl apply. And what it does is it actually downloads the image. It looks at all the configuration information in your Kubernetes manifest. And it says, oh, I need to run five instances of this particular service. Um, and it will actually do the right thing. Um, and then you just need to repeat this for all your dependencies, because if you have a service that depends on three other services, you need to do, um, you need to run this sort of in some sort of recursive kind of way. So, so it's a lot of steps, but you can see that mechanically it's straightforward. Um, and for you to be self-sufficient, you want to put this in some sort of script um, so that you don't, um, 
you don't need to necessarily remember all the details of this. Um, and if you are if you've built a CI/CD pipeline um, to do this, the CI/CD pipelines more or less do the same thing. Um, so so you've written all this code, you've tested it, it runs in your dev cluster. You want to run it in production, right? What are the differences? Well, so more or less the same thing. You do the same thing mechanically. So this is where a script is helpful because you want to actually do things the same way, um, right? Um, one nuance is that when you get to updating the Kubernetes manifest, you might want to put in some more production configuration information. So Kubernetes lets you specify, for example, um, the RAM limit and how much memory you allocate to your particular container. Um, and uh, you might have a lower threshold for your dev cluster than for production, right? So you might want to update that. Um, and, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about why this is important, you also want to start thinking about deploying Envoy um, as part of your production infrastructure so that you can do something like canary routing. And how many people are familiar with canary routing, canaries? OK, so, um, so for the folks who aren't familiar, um, there's a whole bunch of different terms for this, and there are different flavors of this. But what I mean by canaries is basically routing some percentage of your production traffic to the new version, as opposed to doing this huge cutover where you basically route. You go from 100% to version 1 to 100% to version 1.1. You do 99% to version 1 and 1% to version 1.1, so that if 1.1 is going haywire, um, it's not affecting your entire site. Right. Um, so you want to actually, and, and to do that properly, you really need um, a layer 7 router like uh, Envoy. Um, the other thing is you want to make sure you keep the same environment for, uh, same environment and deployment process for um, dev and production to eliminate differences because you don't want the it works for me um, conversation. Um, so then you apply the Kubernetes manifest to the cluster. Um, and then you prefer all the dependencies, including Envoy. Um, and Envoy actually deploys the same way as any other service. Um, and then finally, you want to analyze metrics. Um, so you really want to deploy each service behind Envoy um, because it actually provides, it automatically starts measuring um, basic layer 7 um, metrics like throughput, latency, and availability. Um, so you don't need to figure out how to instrument um, your existing service for this. And then you can add service-specific metrics as appropriate. And you shove this all into Prometheus or Datadog or I think there's like five companies out there that all do this, right? <laughs> so, you know, talk to any of them. Um, so uh, I have no idea which is better. Um, and so what happens is you end up with this, this sort of architecture for distributed development. You basically have your monolith. It talks to an Envoy, which is a layer 7 proxy, which provides the canary routing. Um, it might do authentication, um, because if you're doing an API service and it's independent, you want it to authenticate requests only from your monolith as opposed to random people. Um, it, does, it maps incoming requests to your particular service. Um, and it provides layer 7 observability. And savvy people might note that this looks suspiciously like an API gateway. And yes, it is actually an API gateway. Um, of sorts. It does API gateway type functionality. Um, but you basically want a sophisticated API gateway that supports these general things. Um, so, and so once you actually have a single team that actually has adopted this, you want to start thinking about how you get other teams adopting this. And the key thing is you want to make sure that because each team might be actually at a different point in their development process, you want to support a model where teams can simultaneously be, one team might be developing and prototyping, and another team might be actually running in production. Um, you know, so you want to be able to support um, any of those particular use cases for a given team. So, so the fourth thing we just talked about, hopefully, um, to summarize, is to maximize productivity, you want to optimize that loop. And that loop is making your workflow from source to getting feedback, I'm not saying into production, I'm saying literally to getting feedback, whether it's from your end users or seeing if your code runs or whatever, um, you want to really optimize that, and you want to optimize that by making people as self-sufficient as possible. OK, so safety. So this is, uh, I actually had this before um, the previous talk, but um, I think it's sort of a good se segue, because everyone makes mistakes, everyone makes oops, um, and so I'm going to, if the Wi-Fi holds up, I will do a little demo to show safety because I think it's easier to show um, than to actually talk too much about. So what I'm going to show is actually a sample multi-service application um, running Kubernetes. In this case, I'm using Kubernetes in Google Cloud. Um, 
and uh, I have Envoy as my um, layer 7 router. It's going to send uh, metrics into Prometheus. It's going to talk to this stub authentication service to do some um, hokey basic authentication. Um, and it's got two microservices, um, the task service, which talks to the MongoDB instance, um, and uh, a search service. So, so you can see like there's like four or five things that actually need to be deployed. Um, so let's see. So, um, and you can see like in the in the directory, and I'll I have this is on GitHub. So if people want to try it um, afterwards. Um, so what I'm gonna oh actually so what I'm gonna do is um, is actually let's see if this works. Okay. So I have a Kubernetes cluster. The only thing that's running in it is a database, which is MongoDB, because MongoDB, it turns out, doesn't actually respond nicely to me taking it up and turning it down. So um, I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm actually going to deploy all these services. We have the script that we wrote called Forge, but it basically does all the things we just talked about. It does the Docker build for everything. It does the recursion. Um, and you can see it's actually run everything. So if I do get services, you can see all the stuff is um, running. Or it's, it's spun up, um, and all these pods are running. Um, and what I can do is I can actually open um, a remote shell to the cluster, um, which will take a minute because it's going to spin up a VPN connection. Um, and what I can do once this actually spins up. Um, so what this is actually doing is it's creating a local proxy from my laptop to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that uh, because some of my services aren't actually exposed to the internet, so if I curl to the search service, you can see that it curls to the search service. If I curl to the task service, um, it actually operates. Um, so, um, so those are services running in the cluster, um, and this was my very clever segue because it takes GKE a few minutes to actually give me um, an external IP. So you can see, oh, so I have an IP for Prometheus, and I'm still waiting for that for my API gateway. Um, we'll see if it actually comes up. Um, OK, here we go. So, um, so what I will do is, where's 104? One. So if I curl to um, the gateway URL slash tasks, and I enter in, um, see I have some hokey authentication. Um, you can see if um, this actually, the de demo gods smile at me. OK, so there you go. So it just, so I've just, what I've just done is I've deployed a bunch of services, um, and I've actually exposed the task service and the search service live to the internet through this API gateway. And this API gateway is actually Envoy, right? Um, so, um, so what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to actually generate a little bit of load, um, and you can see this is my load script. And all it does is it um, it's very dumb. Um, I'm going to just run this in a loop. And um, the way I'm going to demonstrate safety is I'm going to actually show the source code for um, the tasks application here. Um, and in here you can see that I have cunningly put a sleep, so it affects performance. So I'm going to implement a massive performance optimization by changing this <laughs> and deleting the sleep. So this app's going to run much faster now. Um, and, uh, and however, since I'm not sure if anything's going to actually break, um, I'm actually going to actually do a canary deploy um, of this. And this is why canaries are actually so valuable, right? So I'm going to actually deploy this thing. Um, and you'll see um, that oh, this is a little. If you can see, uh, there's, a new, uh, there's a new service called Tasks Canary, um, and that's running. And what I can do is I can actually, let's see, where's my Chrome here? Um, I can actually go to, all right. So in Prometheus, is n I'm just using Prometheus here, and I don't really know the query language for Prometheus. So, um, so I'm going to execute this query. Um, and this is actually taking um, latency, and if I Zoom, and I hit to let's say five minutes. Um, 
So I should so so first of all, this is it's a little hard to see with all the scrolling, but basically it's automatically collecting metrics from the API gateway that's sitting in front of the services. Um, and notice that as a developer, I didn't actually do anything. Um, this is just a standard Python web app, but it's automatically connect co collecting metrics. Um, and let's see if I can. Ah, here we go. And what you'll see, actually, which is more interesting, um, it's a little hard. Here, can I zoom? So what you'll see is you'll see that I actually have at the very top these three graphs. That they represent P90, P95, P99 latencies. And the very bottom um, is uh, you can see that at the top, that was my original version, which was exhibiting 600 millisecond latencies, more or less. And then at the very bottom is my canary, um, which is exhibiting much lower latencies. right? And so the reason why you do canary is you can actually deploy route you know, in this case, we're routing 10% of our traffic to the canary. And we're actually looking at the graphs. And we're saying, OK, nothing's breaking, nothing's crashing. Actually, performance, throughput, latency, whatever is actually improved. And then you can actually do the cutover, right? And so this is sort of, and this is just done with just Envoy, Kubernetes, and Docker, and you know, a few, um, few scripts uh, to kind of pull this all together. Um, but this is sort of the power of actually building a, a developer-first workflow. Because if you think about it, well, I'm not really a developer. I only kind of program. But um, if you sort of pretend that I'm a developer, um, I actually haven't actually put in any sort of metrics infrastructure. I haven't actually, um, I actually haven't put in the API gateway. I'm just just deploying it just like I would any other service. And I've basically been able to cargo cult all this stuff from a Git repository. Um, so. Uh, so anyway, so, so basically, I've actually, well, this actually, um, so I go back and forth. So sometimes I have the sleep already in there, and sometimes it's commented it out. So I didn't actually, I picked, I didn't push a buggy update. I pushed an enhanced update into production. But the idea is, you know, sometimes you have that trepidation when you push this button, and you're not actually sure if it's going to work. With uh, Canary workflows, you actually have this assurance of safety such that if it doesn't actually work, you're not screwing everyone. You're only screwing a few people. And that actually feels slightly better, right? <laughs> this is not healthcare, so you're not going to, you know, in healthcare you probably don't want to kill anyone, but uh, <laughs> this time, you know, this is this is a little different. Um, so essentially, what what I'm hopefully you, you're taking away from this talk is that having an efficient development workflow, um, which lets teams be safely self-sufficient, is able lets you actually move really fast and actually not break things. Um, and that, by, by being able to create this distributed workflow, you can have all your teams actually rapidly building um, different services um, very quickly um, using you know, pretty vanilla, off-the-shelf uh, stuff. Um, so anyway, so that's the end. Um, I'm actually not sure about time. But um, I, there's a, I wrote an article that actually walks through this entire Canary workflow, which has a link to the Git repository if you want to play with it yourself. Um, we make open source tools for. Kubernetes, uh, which I sort of demoed, but not really, um, because that's not really what I was trying to do. If you go to our website, um, we're also looking for a C++ engineer to work on Envoy. It's all open source. So if anyone knows of a uh, um, C++ engineer um, who wants to work on network proxies, uh, we're hiring. Um, anyway, thank you. So happy to take any questions. Um, I've listened to, listened to the presentation, and I'm still scratching my head trying to understand what Kubernetes is, what it does for me. Is it an orchestration tool, or is it? Uh, it's just not clear to me. Ah, okay. Sorry. So I probably uh, didn't do a good enough job explaining. Um, so, uh, so the simplest way to think about, or the way I think about Kubernetes, is you have uh, some service or set of services. Um, you, that you put in Docker containers, and you want to run them. And Kubernetes actually runs all, the, uh, all your containers. Right? So in the demo that I showed where I'm sending a request to the API gateway, and, I'm, and that API gateway is then sending that request to um, my web application, all that stuff is actually running um, in Kubernetes. Right? So you could think of it as a, an alternative to um, having a bunch of EC2 instances floating around. I'm happy if anyone else wants to try um, explaining. 
So what uh, Joe said was it's uh, a better way to run virtualization <laughs> akin to um, vSphere, so um, more efficient way to run the data center. Just out of curiosity, uh, you were running that on, on uh, hosted Kubernetes in Google? Yes. Right. Yep, all in GKE. Um, so Canary, de so that Canary deploy, um, I totally get how it works um, for maybe a web worker or something that's stateless. Um, what if you wanted to deploy a like a data service, or you wanted to update Postgres, which yeah, is so, migration or something? Um, so there's a couple ways to handle that. Um, it's a great question. Um, the way that um, we actually are working on, um, we're actually working on Envoy Upstream. So this is one of the things that uh, we want the C++ engineer to actually support uh, to work on is Envoy has a feature called shadowing. Um, and what that lets you do is actually take incoming production traffic and duplicate it in real time. So then what happens is you basically deploy your stateful service, you implement shadowing, and you actually can then route um, you know, one copy of data into real production, one copy into your test systems, right? And you can actually do even cooler things where you actually can, um, the way you really want to do shadowing is you want to actually split it three ways, your in incoming traffic three ways, and you have two versions of your production service um, side by side, and you diff, diff those two, the requ requests, and then you also then diff your test service versus your production service. And the reason why you do this is you want to uh, eliminate stochastic noise. Um, and so then you actually can actually prove in a fairly automated way whether or not your new service, new version of your service actually um, seems to be pretty close to that of your existing service. Um, but you're right. So the canary I show where it's just rerouting 10% of your traffic or whatever um, wouldn't work very well for stateful services. I have a question more about uh, your company, DataWire. Um, doing all this like really cool open source stuff. Is, do you guys provide any hosted products as well? Uh, we we don't provide uh, hosted products. We're basically all about just making the developer's life using Kubernetes easier. That's that's it. Um, I mean, we have a we have a hosted service, um, but it's really uh, for um, called Kubernetes, which lets you do. Um, on-demand ephemeral Kubernetes clusters, so you can run uh, regression tests in your CI system. Um, but that's, uh, but I, I'd say that's, but it's not a hosted offering. It's just basically, um, we actually just wrote it for ourselves. It's not something we charge for anything. It's just, um, it's just this. Uh, we we run regression tests on telepresence, and we use Travis. And in order to run your regressions, you need a Kubernetes cluster, and it turns out it takes like three minutes to spin up a cluster in Google, and then it doesn't go away. So then we just. Um, wrote our own sort of orchestration for that. I've actually got a quick question uh, with the mic. Um, with Canary Workflows, and specifically uh, at an organization that hasn't really used Canary Workflows that much, and we would have to take different amounts of effort to, to use them in different applications, uh, for example, using them to test our database infrastructure would be difficult or not reasonable. W where are like, the low-hanging fruits? Like, which types of applications really benefit from that? Um, like holistically, uh, you know, quick rollback or you know, applications that fail frequently or that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest is basically um, more of your stateless services because um, you don't need to implement um, as much uh, infrastructure. I think the, the biggest bang for the buck would be services that you update frequently that you're worried about uh, impacting end users for, right? So any services where you're like, oh, I'm very nervous about actually updating this, um, that's actually a good candidate, right? So. Um, there's this e-commerce e company um, that we worked with, and they um, one of their big metrics is conversion, right? So the percentage of people who, when they put something in your shopping cart, what percentage of those people actually um, pay you money in the end, um, go all the way to checkout, right? And so when you update the shopping cart, you don't really want conversion to change. You only want it to go up, right? And so um, because you lose all this money if it doesn't, right? And so. So that's a perfect candidate for Canary because you basically have this enhancement to shopping cart. You roll it out. You Canary because it's so sensitive to your overall business. Um, and there was a really good talk. Uh, I can't remember who um, earlier who talked about sort of debugging. And he talked about how the importance of business metrics, right? And I think you really want to think about your business metrics. Things that affect your business metrics are the things that I would start with Canary. If there isn't too many other questions, I was hoping you could go into a little more depth on Envoy and, and what it features. I'm unfamiliar with. Yeah, so um, so Envoy is um, 
so the way I think about Envoy is it gives you all the basic functionality you would see in an Nginx or an HA proxy um, around routing. Um, it adds on um, global rate limiting, circuit breaking, all these sort of resilience, advanced load balancing where it can um, different load balancing algorithms. Um, so that's sort of a, a category of stuff. Um, it offers sort of native HTTP2 and gRPC um, protocol support. Um, that's sort of the second thing. The third thing is, as you saw, it provides um, very rich observability through STATS-D. So it collects all this um, observability um, data automatically and pipes it out through STATS-D interface. And I think the most interesting um, piece is um, traditionally when you look at all these sort of web servers, they are managed through a static configuration file, right? Nginx.com for haproxy.com for whatever. Um, and that works um, reasonably well um, when you have like a few, um, few sort of uh, few proxies that you're floating around. But uh, at Lyft, they have thousands of proxies, right? And um, and you want to basically start orchestrating them together. And so um, there is a set of uh, dynamic um, APIs so that Envoy proxies know to actually continuously pull for um, new changes to say your endpoints so they can actually do dynamic routing. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of, there's probably, I think, six or seven um, uh, APIs that Envoy natively supports designed so that when you deploy um, groups or clusters of Envoys, you can actually have more centralized management um, of those servers. Um, and if you're an Nginx shop, Nginx just rolled out, uh, just announced the Nginx application platform, which includes Nginx Plus, which has some of the stuff they're sort of catching up maybe. Um, but it's all sort of proprietary, and Envoy is 100% open source. So, no, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna help you have a graceful exit. But okay. no, it's all right. You can gracefully exit yourself. I'm 100% positive. But thank you. This was right. I I learned a lot, so I appreciate it. All right. Um, Thanks, everyone.